But every Adventist scientist should know the task of unguided evolution. We've been doing a series of what every Adventist scientist should know. We started off with the philosophy of science. We talked about several parts of Is There a God? We're on the next to the last one. We'll be talking about genetic entropy probably in a couple of weeks. Um, we've uh, talked about how old life is on, uh, on the earth and was there a flood. And we've talked about everything in this except for paleocurrents. We'll come back to that. Next week we'll be talking about the Coconino Sandstone, challenges to young life creation creationism. One of the challenges that uh, appears to have been uh, at least partly solved. Um, and then eventually we'll be talking about Ellen White's health messages because any Adventist who runs into the science data and Ellen White is going to have to deal with that. And um, So we're most of the way through our series. We're starting out with the task of unguided evolution. First, I'm going to give some references that are kind of general in nature. And then we're going to discuss the problem that evolution dis is, was designed to solve. Then the theory itself. And then the constraints of that theory. And then I'll give you my take and uh, uh, then uh, We'll have feedback. Um, the references, a book called Darwin's Doubt by Steve Meyer has a lot of references in it and it's well, well organized. And before that there's a, uh, a book um, by uh, Gager, Axe, and Luskin, Science and Human Origins, that um, again has a lot of references. I in the email, I put a email, uh, an email or a web address. Apparently, the web address is now defunct. Um, and then there's one special article um, by Dirt and Schmidt in 2008, which is printed in genetics and uh, available on the web if you want to. And it's particularly interesting because it's written from the other perspective and yet confirms that the general order of magnitude that uh, has been claimed by um, uh, intelligent design advocates is in fact essentially correct. The problem that el uh, evolution was designed to answer is that frankly life lo looks designed. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe your own eyes. You can believe Richard Dawkins, blind watch watchmaker, page one. Biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. I look designed. Uh, Dawkins is not an outlier. George Gaylord Simpson in 1947. A telescope a telephone or a typewriter, is a complex mechanism serving a particular function. Notice computers aren't there because they weren't common in Simpson's day. Obviously, its manufacturer had a purpose in mind, and the machine was designed and built in order to serve that purpose. An eye, an ear, or a hand is also a complex mechanism serving a particular function. It, too, looks as if it had been made for a purpose. The appearance, this appearance of purposefulness is pervasing, uh, pervading in nature, in the general structure of an, animals and plants, in the mechanisms of their various origin, organs, and in the give and take of their relationships with each other. Accounting for this apparent purposefulness is a basic problem for any system of philosophy or of science. That's the problem. Well. Somebody a little bit newer, uh, Francis Crick, discoverer of DNA, in What Mad Pursuit, page 30. Organisms appear as if they had been designed to perform in an astonishingly efficient way 
And the human mind therefore finds it hard to accept that there need be no designer to achieve this. I think that's a typo that's crept in there. Um, purpose. The universe looks purposeful. In fact, most biologists treat the universe as if it was purposeful. They operate from a de facto intelligent design perspective. When they find a protein or a structure, they don't ask, does it do anything? They ask, what does it do? The assumption is that it does something or it wouldn't be there. As Francis Crick said, this kind of thing is so pervasive that uh, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed but rather evolved. See, if you just took it on face value, you'd think it was designed. So, the design implies a designer, and the designer is a lot smarter than us, and it's really tempting to talk about a designer with a capital D. If you're an atheist, you can't go there. So what are you going to do? Well, the theory of evolution helped that. The theory of evolution, now here I am not talking about just that organisms are related to each other, but I'm talking about a very specific thing that organisms descended from other organisms without intelligent help. That specifically, there were random variations, sometimes mutations, sometimes epigenetic stuff, and then natural selection. And that theory gave a designer substitute, one who could get the appearance of design without an actual designer. And that's really what the theory of evolution is all about. That is the goal of the theory of evolution. Uh, I'm going to be very specific about that. The theory of evolution, and I'm going to put a star behind evolution to distinguish it from all of the other kind of pseudo-evolution kinds of things, or perhaps evolution in a general way, but not, you know, change over time. We're not talking about change over time. We're talking about a very specific theory to solve a very specific problem. As Francisco Ayala put it, <laughs> in <laughs> something entitled Design Without a Designer, natural selection does explain design without a designer. And as Richard Dawkins in The Blind Watchmaker put it in page six, Darwin made it possible to become an intellectually fulfilled atheist. That's the function of Darwinism and its neo-Darwinian descendant. They're intended to, and for many people, they fulfill that function. Make it possible to become an intellectually fulfilled atheist. You can look at that apparent design and say, nah, it's not apparent design. We know how it came about, and it wasn't design. The theory is very simple. Living things produ reproduce more offspring than can survive, so some of them will survive and some of them will not. The offspring are not identical, and some offspring survive and reproduce themselves better than others. And then this is the natural selection part. There are principles that partly determine this differential survival. If you have that, you have evolution. And so, you know, if push comes to shove, people will push it at you and will tell you that evolution is a fact. Even Darwinian evolution is a fact. Because those four things are all true, right? Well, the real question is not, does evolution exist? The real question is, can evolution explain the appearance of design? That's the real question. So, what kind of constraints 
are there on the theory of evolution. In order to succeed, remember it's not enough to prove common descent because common design could explain some of common descent. Um, what Darwinism must supply is an adequate e mechanism to explain life. Does the mechanism do what it's supposed to do? And that's the question we'll ask. Well, what is it supposed to do and how good is it? And those are the questions we're going to dig into. And remember, it's theoretical possibility is not the only criterion. It also should be adequate in both timing and magnitude. If you're asking for 10 to the 95 years, we don't have 10 to the 95 years. We have about 10 to the 10th years, 10 to the 11th, somewhere in there. So it has to, it has to have the proper timing and the magnitude has to be approximately correct. To pl put it bluntly, size matters. How much you can do is going to be important. It's not enough to say, well, we have evolution, so therefore we can explain everything with evolution. No, if you have evolution, but evolution can do only this much, and you need to get this much, you're out of luck. The question is, how fast can evolution work? The Behe's uh, book, The Edge of Evolution, was right on target. Now, it's important to remember that natural selection cannot create. All natural selection can do is select between options that are already there. In order to create, you have to have something else that creates the stuff, and then evolution has, uh, natural selection has to uh, select the right one. And natural selection cannot work on, eventually I want a trunk for an elephant. So I'm going to select for longer and longer noses. It has to, the, the noses have to actually have advantages as, as time is going on that are not outweighed by the disadvantages of breeding some animal for noses. Random variations can be beneficial, but most of the time they're neutral or deleterious. They actually make things worse. And the question is, uh, natural selection not only has the job of making things better in this scenario, it also has the job of keeping things going. That will be our talk next year. Can it even keep up? Um, but, you know, what proportion of mutations are beneficial? Well, if you read the literature, you can come up with numbers from anywhere from one to a thousand, you know, one to a million. Um, and the fact of the matter is, nobody knows for sure, and a very simple reason why is that we haven't seen a beneficial mutation yet. We have seen mutations that are temporarily helpful to the organism. We have not seen mutations that are starting to build a new organ system, or finishing up a new organ system even. I guess you could have back mutations, but of course those would not be advances. Those would be simply restoring something that was already there. And something that's very important is what kind of a fitness in s landscape is there in real biology? And let me illustrate what a fitness landscape is supposed to be. We're going to do it in two dimensions. In reality, it's in hundreds of dimensions. But the two dimension will give you kind of a feel for what we're talking about. 
there will be a small area for a given enzyme that will work. Uh, how small we're, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and inside of that area, you can vary the enzyme quite a bit while maintaining most of its potency. You get outside of the area, the enzyme doesn't work, period. If you go to someplace else, there's another enzyme. And it has a small area where it works. You get outside of that area, and it doesn't work. And so if you're varying some DNA from one configuration to another configuration, in order to get from enzyme A to enzyme B, you're going to have a lot of mutations that will take you out into nowhere. And you're going to have a few mutations that if you keep going in that general direction, you'll eventually get to the other enzyme. There are some enzymes that are pretty close to each other, like 90% or 95% identical. Most of them are more like 60% identical. Um, just to give you an illustration, this is, a, this is going to be a difficult job for evolution to get from enzyme A to enzyme B or enzyme C. Now it's a little bit easier if you can go along some kind of a pathway where you all, where you still have function and get let's say halfway or three quarters of the way to enzyme B, and maybe you can kind of jump across there. Ideally, the thing to do is to go here. Now there's a problem with this, is because this has function A, this has functions A, C, and D, which are pretty close to each other. This has function B, and the truth of the matter is, in order to climb across this little isthmus, you have to lose a good share of function. Now you still haven't gotten to, to, to uh, say, function F here. There are some people who propose that there's a little tunnel that can go across in certain instances to F. In a fully Darwinian pathway, what you actually want to see is something that, as it goes, gets better and better. And you're climbing this hill that has this gradual slope that never dips down. Well, how much can it dip down? Well, that's a matter for research. So the question is, is biology more like this, or is biology more like this? And again, that's a question for research. And the, another question that we have to ask is, if you get down to that bottom level, is that land or is that water? Can you actually walk across? Or are you going to have to swim with the sharks and have the currents pull you away and whatever? Can you get from uh, island A to island B simply by walking a plane between them? Or are you going to have to kind of jump across because if you land anywhere in the middle, you die? Now, whether there is water or land or both between the islands is a question of fact. You can check that out. The distance between the islands is also a question of fact. And we'll see, some people have tried to answer that. How far one can travel in a given time period is a matter mostly of theory, but with a little bit of fact, uh, you, can do, you can find out what the mutation rate is. Now, the theory has to be able to explain the facts in order to be an adequate theory. But you'll find people who don't view it that way. The theory must be adequate because we're here. So it's the only game in town. We toss out God uh, right off the bat. 
We toss out aliens right off the bat. So it had to happen via evolution, and therefore evolution must be adequate. Regardless of the question of whether the theory of evolution max matches the facts of biology. And if you don't understand that, you just don't understand evolutionary theory. And you'll run into people all the time who say, well, you don't understand evolution. Well, actually, you can understand evolution without accepting it. And that's, the, that's where these people are going. But let's try to understand the theory and the facts as they are documented in the literature. In 1977, uh, Hubert Yaki published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology a study he did on cytochrome C. He took natural cytochrome C variants, you know, from people, yeast, um, whatever was in the literature that he could find, and said it varies this much. And so that much variation must be kind of an average natural variation. Now, cytochrome C is 100 amino acids. So the probabilities of getting any one particular uh, amino acid variant is 20 to the 100, or about 10 to the 130. Now, what he found was that there were 10 to the 40th different kinds of cytochrome C that you could get that still worked. But that leaves you a probability of 10 to the 90, 1 in 10 to the 90, of actually getting a workable cytochrome C from just uh, random amino acids. That's, uh, if, you, if you figure that there's that much difference between, uh, uh, between different kinds of cytochrome C, you can say, well, this particular site can vary this much, and this particular site can vary this much, this particular site can vary this much. Um, when you get done calculating all that stuff, there, if you can figure that there's probably 10 to the 40th different kinds of cytochrome C that will actually do the job. It's an estimate. It's not a exact. I mean, 10 to the 40 would be more experiments than he could do. So you're going to have to do some random sampling and interpolating. But you know, it's, it's probably it's the first honest attempt to ask, how much variation can you have and still get a usable protein? Reidhard and Olson and Sauer in 1990 tried it a little bit differently. They took uh, E. coli and mutated them and checked to see which ones had lambda repressor that was functional. And they particularly concentrated on two alpha helical regions. And so basically, they were creating mutations, which is a little better way of doing it than Yaki was doing. Um, they were dealing with a protein that had 92 amino acids. Um, it's uh, 1.3 times uh, uh, 10 to the 92 would be, I have to calculate it out. Um, and they figured that there is an even wider arrangement that could actually work in this particular area. Now, is the difference due to cytochrome C having a smaller island of functionality than lambda repressor? I don't know. Um, or perhaps is it due to the fact that when you actually do the mutations, you get a bigger spread? 
but it's still only one in 10 to the 63 sequences were functional. This is really pretty remarkable. Now these are relatively small proteins, 100 amino acids, 92 amino acids. Um, uh, Douglas Axe in 2004 published in the Journal of Molecular Biology, notice this is mainstream stuff. These are from the peer-reviewed literature. And um, this was estimating folds, and they took a protein length of 150 amino acids. Any protein that had 150 amino acids, would it fold, period? Only one in 10 to the 74th proteins even folds. And if it doesn't fold, it can't fold into a particular shape that's going to do a job. His estimate for functional proteins is actually one thousandth of that. One in 10 to the 77th proteins is actually functional. These are the best estimates from the literature that I know of. I've never seen anybody quote numbers less than that, uh, except for one poorly designed study that tried to claim that you could get folding in 10 to the 11th or something like that which I think um, is probably not particularly helpful. Um, there's a huge sea of non-functional sequences. You want to get an idea of how big that sea is? Well, if you took an Earth-sized ocean, in fact, we're going to take an, an ocean that's 19 times the size of the Earth just to make it easy. This is not the earth size the ocean, our ocean right now. This is the entire Earth turned into ocean, and then, you know, 19 of them are a ball that's uh, 2.3 times the size of the Earth, whichever you prefer. Uh, one comes up with an island width of 10 to the minus 27 millimeters. To give you some idea, a hydrogen nucleus is 10 to the minus 12 centimeters, 1.73 times 10 to the minus 12 centimeters. This is submicroscopic. In order to hit those things, you have to know where they are. This is not something you just start tossing coins and, and randomly wind up with something. Uh, then the next question is, how far apart can those islands be? Or how far apart are those islands? And Ann Gager and Douglas Axe found two proteins that did two different jobs that by everybody's account were very closely related to each other. Um, And so they took, um, they took an enzyme that break, uh, broke down th threonine and an enzyme that built biotin, and they have the same folds, so you don't have to worry about you know, getting the folds right. All you've got to do is make sure that they, that they bind the right places to the right stuff. And it turned out that it took seven mutations to get from island to island. That's the best case scenario. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe there's a protein that goes halfway in between them that nobody's actually studied yet. But um, as we talked about last week, that's vaporware, actually. You're hoping. They specifically tried to find two islands that were close together. Well, how far can you jump from one island to another? Depends on if you're bacterium or if you're a person. Bacteria can jump pretty well. Um, in the Edge of Evolution, they searched for the limits of Darwinism, New York Free Press. Behe discusses chloroquine complexity clusters. 
and he talks about a case with two mutations. And he's actually citing the literature. This is not his estimate. This is somebody else's. And the probability from getting something that will stop chloroquine from killing a malarial pest, which is good for the malarial pest and not so good for the people who happen to have that particular pest. The probability is about 1 in 10 to the 20th. Somebody else didn't like that. A couple of people called Dirt and Schmidt. And so they published another article. And this is again in the peer-reviewed literature, waiting for two mutations. It takes two mutations to get chloroquine, probably both of which are slightly detrimental. And that's probably why the difference between be his estimate and their estimate. But their estimate is for a totally neutral uh, mutation plus one that is very highly selected. And their probability for two mutations is one in 10 to the 15th. Now, bacteria can do better than that. But for people, for elephants, for large mammals that have long gestation times, there aren't enough people or proto-people to go that way. And it means that every step has to be advantageous. Every single step. That is, you saw the scenario where you know, the two islands were real close to each other. That won't work for people. It has to be that one that leads up all the way. For bacteria, they are allowed to jump seven. Pardon me, they're allowed to jump six, which interestingly is one less than the seven that Gager and Axe found between two very closely related enzymes. And that may be the best case because if we do it with some other ones, it's probably going to be more than that. So basically, you can't get there from here. The mathematics of the theory of evolution are inadequate to explain what we have discovered in biology. We're talking amino acid mutations? That's for amino acid mutation. Well, it's for for DNA mutations that produce amino acid mutations. So a base pair or, or a code Right, base pair mutations. Now, as I look at that, I say there just isn't enough time for evolution to have taken place. Sure, if you had gazillions of years, you could get to jump some of those things. Uh, maybe not for some of them because if the if you're constantly being pulling back, pulled back to the island, anybody living on the plain you see can be outcompeted by the people that are up on the top. Um, it might not even work for gazillions of years, but it certainly isn't going to work for the time that we have. The islands can't be just randomly hit. There's no way. Just hitting one island would take all of your probabilistic resources, let alone the rest of them. The islands are too far apart for island hopping. And so the evolutionary mechanism which was there to explain the appearance of design, cannot explain the appearance of design. At least not rationally, not with the resources we have now. Which means that Darwinists will have to go back to being intellectually unfulfilled. Sorry about that. Now. All of this is not to say that evolution doesn't work. It can. I'll give you the best example I can give you. Polar bears are white. Arctic foxes are white. 
Ptarmigans are white. Varying hairs are white. Certain seals are white. Why are they white? Well, there are two reasons you can give. Number one, they're better camouflaged. That is natural selection at work. Could be divine selection, but natural selection will work. The second reason they're white is because they can't make melanin. Polar bears can inter interbreed with grizzly bears, with Alaskan brown bears. They're not really that much different. But the difference is that they're albino. That's what they are. It's a lot easier to destroy melanin production than to start melanin back up again. And virtually everybody that you talk to will admit that the polar bears came after the other bears and that the arctic foxes came after the other foxes and that the ptarmigans came after other birds. That the movement is from more information to degraded to less information. So it's not evolution in the traditional sense, getting higher and higher and finally reaching humans. It is devolution. It's really hard to document evolution of something new and different and unique. What I think we can safely say is that life is not structured for Darwinian evolution. It doesn't have those nice, neat little pathways that go up there. And without those, evolution fails to explain the appearance of design. Now, you'll hear a lot about, well, we don't believe in uh, Darwinian evolution anywhere anymore. It's a very minor thing. Most of what we've got is random variation, neutral evolution, as they call it. Neutral evolution does happen. But neutral evolution cannot explain the origin of what looks like design. So you're stuck. The thing that you counted on to explain the origin of design won't explain it. And you can't pull a neutral evolution at that point and say, well, you know, the random things happen and it just happen to come that way. No. Evolution is a failure at the exp explanation of the appearance of design. Evolution, to put it bluntly, is not adequate to the task. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Just might uh, <clears throat> add a little constraint, further constraint on this picture from the standpoint of the fossil record. Uh, you don't have 13, 10, 13 billion years for this to happen, and at least according to current IDs, the Earth is. Uh, yeah, 4.6 4. 4. for Earth 6 itself. Million. But uh, in that 4.6, you probably have about 300 million years to start life between the time it cooled down enough to support life and uh, life appeared. the time that we, we see it in the fossil record. And then the thing gets uh, much more severe uh, because life remains in that more or less simple uh, one cell state for about three billion years uh, so that uh, five six of your fossil record is essentially no evolution beyond the cell the uh, simple cell level and then you have the cambrian explosion and there uh, the bayon figures use being very generous to evolution 50 million years 
Uh, well, you actually have the E.D. Yeah. Akron explosion, and then the Cambrian explosion, and then the, the bird Irish explosion, coup. and the mammal explosion. Uh, so uh, you've got uh, very little time in the fossil record for evolution, actually. I mean, most of the fossil record doesn't show evolution. Uh, so uh, the improbability has become more severe uh, as you restrict the time uh, and make the case much more difficult for evolution. Oh, you're right. You're right. This is, this is actually a very benign look. This is giving them all of the advantages you can, and it still won't work. Yeah. Uh, Behe got into that uh, uh, time issue a little bit with his uh, chloroquine uh, stuff and so on. I, and as you mentioned, uh, <laughs> you get into uh, slow reproducing organisms uh, like vertebrates, higher vertebrates uh, especially, you know, they lay eggs and so on, incubate and another generation, uh, takes a year for another generation and so on. Uh, uh, and in humans it's ten years, in elephants it's... Uh, it's furthermore, you know, uh, we can add this picture of uh, mycoplasma, you know, well, uh, some people, it's the simplest semi-independent organism we know of, you know, and, but uh, we're, we're 10,000 times more complicated our genome than, than mycoplasma. Uh, everywhere you look, you got tremendous problems here for, for evolution, unless you have some kind of designer. I agree. And the animals that you mentioned, you mentioned that they were albinos. They're not truly albinos. They have black eyes, black noses, their skin is, is dark, particularly in the bears. So there's something going on there. They are changing. It's just not from being a grizzly bear to being an albino polar bear. Well, you're right. Uh, the fact of the matter is that not, albi not all albinos are albinos. Um, there are some that, that simply can't make melanin at all, and everything looks pale. Uh, you know. If you have one of those, the uh, skin will be pale. For example, in humans, the skin will be pale. The eyes will be uh, pink. pink. The hair will be uh, platinum blonde uh, or even higher, you know, silver. Uh, everything is, everything is there, there's no melanin anywhere. There are people who have, who are very pale, but who have, for example, blue eyes. So they can make melanin in the eyes, but not elsewhere. Uh, and so it's not really a loss of the ability to make melanin, period. It's a loss of the ability to make melanin in the hair follicles. So there's a, it's, it's not a full albino most of the time. Uh, but it's effectively that. It's basically the loss of the ability to make uh, pigment in, in the hair. And in fact, nowadays you'll even see uh, some bears in, uh, in the, uh, uh, say, the United States that will, be, will have kind of this cream color. <coughs> and if you look at uh, polar bears, they're not totally white, white. They, you know, they're just kind of just barely off-white. You can imagine uh, a white that's whiter than what they've got. Mm -hmm. The Arctic foxes, don't they turn into a dark color in the summer? Well, the, let's see, the Arctic foxes, again, you can interbreed an Arctic fox with some of the foxes from down south, and uh, they'll produce offspring. Uh, uh, you know, which will have varying amounts of color. It's probably a multi-factorial uh, thing, but it's, it is a loss of the ability to put melanin into the hair follicles. Uh, now, something that's a little bit more interesting is the varying hair, which turns white in the winter and then turns uh, brown in the summer. <coughs> and so that's a little more subtle. Uh, 
And that may, if you, if you wanted to push it, it would be very interesting to see where, what the mechanism for that is and whether that mechanism is actually built into other hairs or not. all have that mechanism yeah. and, and, and throughout our body because some genes. And, and, and why it turns on in the winter and tur or turns off in the winter and turns on in the summer is not totally clear. Well, just it, in certain parts of our body, certain sets of genes are turned on and other sets are turned off. So that mechanism exists. So that's, that's one place where you could actually say that there's uh, information being added uh, the problem is what you want to do to test that would be to um, take the genetic information in the varying hair and, and compare it with the genetic information in, let's say, jackrabbits or cottontails or something like that. Um, and that's actually some place where some research could be done. Um, because if the varying hair has a brand new a uh, repressor that only happens during the winter and doesn't happen during the summer, then you've actually gained some information there. If, on the other hand, uh, that's already built into the other hairs, then all you have to do is move them up someplace where, when it's winter, the white coloration is advantageous, and then they can just make it on their own. All they have to do is to is to lose the ability to produce melanin in the winter. Um, this is one of the things about science, that I presented the data as we have it. Uh, there are some other places where we don't have all the data. And that's some place where a good scientist could go and do some research. Uh, and it's an interesting question from a creationist point of view. It's an interesting question from an evolutionist point of view. Uh, it's kind of surprising to me that no evolutionist has ever taken up the challenge. Because this would be some place where they might be able to prove that, in fact, there is more information. Uh, yes, uh, Ariel. Yeah, uh, that last comment of yours uh, makes me raise a question here, and this is uh, a little more difficult uh, than what we've discussed here, but I think uh, something we need to uh, ask. Uh, how do you get major sociological changes. Uh, to preface that, I'll say uh, it seems obvious, it should be obvious to the scientific community that their model does not work. Uh, the scientific community has rejected God. Uh, read my book, Science Discovers God, for account of what's going on there. Uh, God used to be part of science. Modern science was established in a theistic context. God had established the laws of nature. He was the author of those laws, and those laws made the study of science possible. Lion laws gave the consistency of science that made uh, logical thinking possible. And, and that is arguably one reason why uh, science started in Western Europe rather than in China or India or the Muslim world. Yeah, uh, yeah. those uh, civilizations like those of India and China had plenty of time to develop science. They, they did not develop it and it's thought, according to uh, major historians like Collingwood and uh, Hokius and so on, uh, the reason that science developed in the Western world was because we had a consistent God in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which uh, the capricious gods of these other cultures did not have. Uh, but coming to, to the uh, present uh, situation, uh, in the latter part 
of the 19th century, science rejected God, put him out of the picture. It's going to answer everything on a purely naturalistic thing, and they stood by that, and they find themselves in this bind that that, uh, that they're in, that uh, so many things are unexplained and, and seem to require, still they, they don't want to move into that. And, uh, to me, the question we need to ask is, uh, uh, what can we do to help affect it's a sociological phenomenon. It's not data. We're not fighting data here in this issue between God, uh, science and, and religion. In We're fact, I kind of like uh, the data. Uh, it, uh, yeah, <laughs> it, very much the, the, the data, <laughs> very much in favor of, of design and so on. Uh, uh, it, it's an attitude. It's a, uh, a sociological phenomenon. It's, you know, we're... we're, uh, we're, we're not dealing with data, we're dealing with sociology, uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, psychology, uh, per se, and uh, uh, factors that aren't based on the actual data of nature. Uh, so uh, the data of nature seems to say there is a designer, uh, the scientific community says, no, we're going to be naturalists. We're going to answer everything just from the data of nature. And, of course, if you can answer everything from the data of nature, you have to say there's no God. Uh, effectively, science is, operates as, as uh, atheists. Uh, what, on the, on the other picture from our, our perspective in the Bible and so on, God is trying to do everything to save every person he can, including every one of these scientists. And uh, what uh, can we do and what should be our attitude in the context of God's purpose, uh, that broad purpose? Uh, uh, and of course, God acts sometimes, he acts very firmly and so on, otherwise, and so on. Uh, what do we need uh, a more redemptive appro approach than we've had, or are we doing what is right? Uh, this is kind of a question that uh, I'd like, I don't have the answer, but I'd like to see it discussed. Extinctions. Scientists tell us we've had huge numbers of extinctions of species. How does evolution explain that they got started but failed? That depends on how detailed an explanation you want. Um, what I mean by that is, well, obviously, the environment changed and they weren't fit for it. What part of the environment changed that they weren't fit for? Um, perhaps the most famous one is the asteroid that's supposed to have done away with the um, dinosaurs. One of the odd parts is that the dinosaurs are actually decreasing in numbers before the, uh, uh, before the asteroid hit. And there are a few of them that seem to have survived for a little while. Now what do you do? It wasn't just the asteroid. Um, It's a difficult question to answer because if they were good enough for the Triassic, why weren't they good enough for the Eocene? Or the Paleocene? I, I would just add that it's a very interesting question that was raised here about this. Uh, it seems to me that, that these major extinctions, which we uh, run into about six or seven of them in the fossil record as you're going up through the fossil record, uh, these pose a, a serious challenge to those who claim that God created over millions of years. 
what kind of intelligent God that could create life would create all these organisms only to have them die out. Then you go over, say, in the uh, Ordovician, and then you have uh, Silurian extinction, and you got the Permian extinction, and so on. Uh, so he repeatedly creates, uh, and they die out, and then he starts another set of organisms, and so on and so forth. Uh, this doesn't... Uh, it's this, almost as if God is learning. Uh, if he could create life, <laughs> why would he do this kind of thing? It, it's a serious challenge to, to the long ages, uh, any of the long ages model that involved God as the designer, uh, which, you know, uh, many churches adopt that particular model. At age 85, there's about a one in minus 20. If you're going to talk about probability that I'll be able to articulate what's on my mind very well, but hopefully I will. <laughs> this um, it's, has to do with the philosophy of science, or better, the history of uh, what has been learned and who has been responsible for it or who takes the credit. I have, I'm about as a priori, a priori uh, favor I take as my premise that Genesis is correct and that there is a God. I don't, that isn't the question. What I'm looking at though is the history of how all our knowledge came out. And I think of God's particularly blessing the Jewish nation, the sons of Abraham, with, the complete, with as much knowledge as he was willing to give to humanity about salvation and about redemption. Uh, but they've not been responsible for any of this, any of our science, at least in historic times, that they are able to, and that they do have that the Jewish people do have that the genes for it is certainly beyond question. Take Einstein. Uh, many of the Jews in the present era have been more responsible for our understanding of basic science than just about anybody else. Although uh, then generically the Westerns from New Newton on certainly have been the ones that have clarified it. But you look back at the Jews and what they were preoccupied with, and I have to presume that this was the doing of God because he inspired them and they thought along the lines of what he was inspiring them to think. You look in Proverbs, for example, the wisest man that ever lived did nothing but issue Proverbs. A uh, merry heart doeth good likes a medicine. Meanwhile, it was the Greeks who really did, as I understand it, maybe I'll need to be educated on this, who laid the foundation for our science. Uh, they were the ones who invented such <coughs> things as experiments. Meanwhile, the wisest man that ever lived was simply issuing proverbs. As, as, as useful and as uh, indispensable as they are to our society. But um, Plato believed in a sort of God, a sort of the one, the prime, but not actually God. And Paul had to point out he, they didn't know what they believed in, but meanwhile they went hell-bent on inventing science and mathematics and proof. And it is that that um, will be our salvation against Darwinism. It just seems awfully ironic that it was a non, that it was a group of people that, as near as I know, uh, were not inspired by God that laid the foundation for such things as Darwinism and yet they turn around and are the farthest from science. It is a 
a very ironic and complex turn of events. Uh, there, it was about one in 200 that I'd make any sense, and I think that probability proved correct. We would come in the back. There. Anybody have any comments on that, or do you understand what I'm saying? I once started out the same premise as you. I noticed that in the who's who of famous people in the world, there were an awful lot of Jewish names. I and suspected it, it was because they were of Jewish stock, you know, of God's people. So I studied the matter. I interviewed the chief rabbi in London. And he, uh, when I explained all the, asked about the greatness of the Jewish, his answer was, pardon my accent, we are the people of God. So he was looking at a genetic thing. And I thought that was a good theory until I was hitching in a truck across the Andes and we picked up another hitchhiker who was a Jew. Though he had a little Christian cross as an earring. And I explained my theory to him and he just laughed at me. Of course, we're dealing with a different epoch here, but he said the reason Jewish people are so smart is that it's a measure, it's a, it's a means of survival to them. They have been persecuted and driven from place to place. He says when a Jewish parents make the education of their children paramount over everything else to survive, you have to be educated and rich to survive. And so kind of poked a hole in my theory, but I suppose I still believe it, whether it's uh, right or wrong, we are the people of God. I think that you can add one more thing to that, and that is that the Jews actually have done quite well. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not a perfect measure, but um, approximately one-third of the Nobel Prizes that have been awarded have gone to Jews. And of course, if you want to compliment somebody for being brilliant, the name that's usually pulled out right now is that of Einstein. Well, let me just um, put in some more. I'm speaking from the standpoint of looking at the Bible. I'm fully aware that the Jews nowadays, uh, in trying to explain how brilliant they are, rec take recourse to the fact that they've been persecuted and had to. Well, so does everybody else. I don't think that argument really holds. It's uh, rather amusing to me more than, than informative. Mm, and because I've if you're going to so apply much. it to Jews, you have to apply it to gypsies, for example. Well, uh, they had to because they were persecuted so much, and that was the only way they had to survive, the survival of the fittest sort of thing. Well, now there is a kind of a direction of mutations that would have to be difficult to would be, need to be explained too. But I'm talking about looking at the Bible and looking at what the Jewish people in the days when they were directly in contact with God, what their preoccupation was. I'm not talking about now or how they got to their brilliance in science now. Uh, that is undisputed, but the idea that they got there by simply having to because they were persecuted is to me just nothing more than amusing. Uh, the, uh, per, Jewish humor is so very funny, perhaps and that's maybe part I of the can, humor. I can put it this way. The question you're asking is, well, why didn't Solomon say that the earth was round? Why was he more interested in Proverbs than he was in science? Well, a lot of the sci Proverbs were about science, but uh, even so, they're kind of gross descriptions. Um, they're not, they're not uh, well-founded theory. And I agree with you. I think that that's a, an interesting point. Um, I'd like to make one, uh, one other set of points that I think that are important. Um, we've talked about how uh, the Judeo-Christian view of a God who is orderly and can do what he wants means that you expect laws, but you also have to look at nature to find out what God did because he wasn't compelled by logic to do what he did. He ch freely chose to do it. Um, that's a very important foundation of science. Uh, the reason science didn't advance in the Middle Ages is people were, well, they valued the way they thought more than the way they observed. Um, 
uh, they talked about saving the appearances. Well, you don't save the appearances. You have to save the theory. Because the appearances are there, whether the theory, you know, they're, they're, you're stuck with the appearances. Um, but there's, uh, there are people who apparently feel that that gives too much credit to religion. And so now they're trying to explain the rise of science in Western civilization because the genes of the people who are there were better. And this is a big controversy right now that's going on. Um, I'm trying to think of what the guy's name is. He just published a book. And you're, you're going to run into all kinds of people discussing it because it's, you know, it's starting to sound racist. Uh, it's beyond the bell curve. There's somebody else. It's, uh, there's, um, I want to say Walsh or something like that. Um, I'll, I'll try to get the name for her. Uh, for it um, another time, um, but uh, this guy is this guy has been publishing his theory, and his theory is that um, the people in Western Europe, <coughs> that's white people, just had better genes, and that's why science developed in Western Europe. Uh, <laughs> as you can um, imagine, it's a uh, uh, not considered politically correct, and so he's running into a buzzsaw. Uh, and I think that he's trying to explain why science arises in Western Europe <coughs> without explaining it because of their theology. And you see, if it wasn't, if it wasn't their theology, then what was it? Well, it must have been because they were better people. Well, how were they better people? Well, it was because of their genes, because the genes make the person. I mean, it just proved. And, uh, of course, I, I think what's happening is that, that the tendency to try to avoid the idea that God is important and that what we think about God is important has, has pushed people to go in places that they would never would have gone else, else otherwise and uh, we're looking at uh, frankly calling uh, you know us the superior race because God has blessed us mm -hmm. but we don't want to call it God that's what I think is happening yes well <clears throat> it's it's not related to your topic but this issue of the Jews I mean here's here's my theory and that is Jews have a book and you can't understand the book if you can't read. And so uh, literacy was advocated at all levels, at the home, and the synagogue, everything. And so probably Jews were more literate than most people uh, throughout history. Uh, and so because they're more literate, they also uh, learn more about science and got involved uh, in science and mm -hmm. you know, learning from other people and whatnot. Probably not just science, all areas of learning. Uh, <clears throat> and then combine that with it being a very religious uh, community because their culture is based upon you know the the Bible the Torah um, and so uh, a very religious uh, distinct community is is going to push its children to do good things and one of those good things is to is to pursue education because that's how you can advance yourself uh, and so I, I'm guessing the Jewish culture is a highly educated uh, culture uh, and that might be able to explain the the um, uh, the Nobel prizes. Well, I think there's one other thing that belongs in there, and that is that for a couple of millennia now, the Jews have not been allowed to own property. I mean, it was flat out illegal to own farmland. Uh, the state of Israel is where they have first been able to have property. Period. Uh, for many, I mean, uh, in Europe, it was traditional Jews didn't have property. And if they got chased out of somewhere, what they had was what was on their backs and what was in their heads. And so they tend to work with things that were very valuable but very small that you could carry with you. Goldsmith. Uh, and 
they tended to do things that you could walk off and do someplace else. Medicine, law, the professions. And so you were looking at you were looking at people who very highly valued what was inside of one's head. Uh, and I think there's some of the blessing of God too. But that's you know that's that's something that will be very difficult for us to tease apart here. Uh, how much of it was the blessing of God? How much of it was the other stuff? And maybe some of the blessing of God was to actually have them uh, uh, value literacy as part of it. I have another theory. Environment. Third world countries. I am most familiar with Latin countries. The living is easy. Why do more than you absolutely have to? You can pick fruit from the jungle. You can cultivate a little bit. Your house is made of sticks. But up north where it's cold, people had to innovate and develop and invent and were more vigorous. They hustled. How's that for a theory? Well, it's a, it's a good theory. Um, are the northern Chinese more industrious than the southern Chinese? What we should do with those kinds of theories is start testing them on other groups and see if they fit. I have another theory. <laughs> Intermingling, say, Caucasian stock with Chinese stock tends to produce exceptional children. Hybrid vigor. So does that explain Jews? Because they tend to marry by themselves. Well, there may, be, there may be some of that too. The other thing is, I think th that you shouldn't discount the idea of having to live in two different worlds, having to figure out, not being able to take for granted that your assumptions are actually truth because you know that there are other assumptions that could be taken. It teaches you to think outside the box. And I think that, particularly in the case of Einstein, you know, he lived in two different cultures. He lived in his home culture, and he lived in his school culture. And he could compare the two. And he could ask questions about culture that wouldn't be asked by kids without those two different, uh, two different things. I am firmly of the opinion that if you learn uh, another language, it will help you in a number of different ways, one of which is you learn to conceptualize better. But it's second, and you know, just the sheer exercise of using your brain makes it uh, more agile. But the second thing is that you learn on a gut level that words are not the same as the things that they refer to. And that's a lesson that many people have to understand and, and find it difficult to understand, particularly people who um, go into English teaching. They seem to think that the, that the word is the same as the deed. In fact, um, it could be said that we have a president right now who thinks that if you make a speech, it solves the problem. And uh, it doesn't. You know, there's a difference between words and the things they refer to. Some more theories. Uh, cultural momentum, uh, perhaps there's something to be said with how a, how a subculture gets started that maintains itself over a significant period of time. Uh, so perhaps uh, the Hebrews, Jews, Israelites, um, uh, perhaps gypsies, uh, perhaps um, uh, Adventists, for example, uh, to where it sort of perpetuates itself. Um, and uh, also, if you have a small group, perhaps persecuted, a group that's uh, noticeably distinct from the rest of the culture, uh, and perhaps persecuted for that reason, uh, if not other things, um, then there'll be a strong self-identity that maintains itself over a long period of time. And there could be a sense of wanting to support your own people. Uh, and perhaps that would mean uh, 
uh, favoring them uh, with, with opportunities. If you're in charge of the medical school, perhaps you might favor, you know, if, if you're on the missions committee, perhaps you may favor uh, people of your, of your own subgroup. Uh, and so perhaps there could be a, um, a, an explanation there uh, why, why Jews uh, uh, over time uh, advance in, in, in various fields. Well, I think it's multifactorial, and I think it's difficult to tease all those apart. And the fact of the matter is we don't have enough control groups to be able to, to sort this, all of this out. But to get back to the original subject, I think it's interesting that the, the evolutionary perspective simply it used to be that you tell a story and it sounded good and then that's good enough. But we now have data as to how far you can go and how far apart these islands of functionality are. And it turns out that they're too far to reach. If you were to, uh, if you were to not have evolutionary theory and you had to reinvent it now, it would fail the tests that we have out for it. And in fact, I'm wondering whether over time, more and more scientists will recognize that in fact it is failing the test. And they'll have to come up either with something else or they'll have to admit that yes, intelligent design actually is a good explanation for the apparent design in nature and that evolution is not. Well, bad, bad theories can last a you know, very long time until there's a better theory uh, to supplant it. And then uh, my experience is when that happens, like, oh, yes, yes, of course, we knew there was a problem before. But now that we have this new solution, we've got, you know, it's like, well, excuse me, you didn't really tell me before that there's, there are these problems, you know. I have another theory. <laughs> that has to do with authority and control over a populace. The church, through history, has been one that has repressed development. And great swaths of the peoples of the earth are either under the control of the church or of an authoritarian government that does not permit them to, to change. And then, there's the matter of class, and uh, you're, where you're born determines what you will be, and there's uh, no chance for you to progress. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration. That's true. The only, the only problem that I have with that particular theory is that it appears that the onset of the really big advances in science uh, happened at roughly the same time and in fact slightly earlier than the Protestant Reformation which is when the uh, the standard church hierarchy lost its control um, now I will have to say that some of it happened afterwards and so you can say that the full flowering came afterwards but Copernicus was a Polish priest, and I think uh, that if you look it up, that his material was being published before Luther, and certainly before Luther was influential enough to be able to offer a haven. And there's no evidence that Luther deliberately offered a haven. I think the closest you could get was that Melanchthon was a little more friendly than some. And it appears that that was true early and later on he turned against it. Um, I suppose you could claim that Kepler and in Newton in particular were allowed freedom from church hierarchy. And that meant something. Um, but I think that you still, if, if you look at Newton, Boyle, you know, the, the famous English uh, uh, scientists were extremely religious 
Uh, I mean, Newton wrote more on uh, the Bible than he did on science. That's hard for people to believe, but it's true. I've read some of his, science, uh, his Bible stuff. It's very interesting. Um, and so you can't say that he was just freed from the church, but you could say that he was freed from the church hierarchy, I suppose. So I think there may be some truth to what you have to say. He, he was not a Trinitarian. He was not a Trinitarian. And he uh, got, he got in he trouble kept with that the church. under wraps. I just wanted to point out that most people think that science is totally objective, that it's based on totally on evidence. But it seems to me that there's a that science and its theories, especially when it comes to to the parts that ha that has to be extrapolated, like you have to have ideas or theories to explain things. I think that that part of science is highly subjective to the to the present uh, ideas that are floating around in the pop population in, a, in other words uh, science is more about uh, that part of science is more about human psychology uh, that or about human feelings than about evidence <coughs> I think you're right about that yeah I would add to that uh, comment uh, science is secular stance is a theological statement uh, and science when it takes the position that we're not going to include God in our conclusions we're going to be naturalistic uh, science is making a theological statement that there is no God and they don't have, that is not an objective statement. They have not proved that there is no God. Uh, so that uh, science is what scientists do. It's mm -hmm. not just the objective survey of nature, although they claim that that's their approach. Uh, they're making theological statements. Uh, as they exclude God arbitrarily from their in explanatory menu. I, I have a, a thought about this business about science uh, finally being overwhelmed by the idea of the designer, uh, that they have to accept the designer. At that time, what will the anti-God people do, will they then go to the, the, the prince of this world, the fallen angel, and worship him as the designer? Well, I think you will see uh, some people just hide down and become closet atheists. You know, I, I think that you will see some people that uh, will say, okay, there's a God, and then, and then just take the worst aspects of it and, uh, and go with them. I think that there are, are, will be a minority, but it will be a significant minority, and it's worth working at, uh, that will say, well, now that we have gotten rid of the scientific objections to uh, belief in the Bible, uh, that the kind of God I like is the kind of God that actually, you know, cares about me, cares about other people, um, uh, can be gotten from the biblical record, and has that kind of belief. And I, th I think that that's that. If we are looking forward to the possible downfall of the current scientific regime, we should be alert. It's happened before. It happened, in, for example, in Russia, um, where suddenly people lost confidence in the government. Uh, 
and they lost confidence in the government story, which was an atheistic one. And you had people who suddenly were more than willing to consider Christianity. Um, and I think the Adventist brand of Christianity is particularly attractive to those people because it's, it makes sense, it's logical, it's uh, biblically based. And uh, uh, and it doesn't require you to check your brains in at the door when you walk into church. The big sticking point uh, was, well, evolution has got this all covered and we've got to believe that. And once people uh, don't believe, uh, you know, people don't believe in atheism anymore, evolution is just another theory. It's another apparently failed theory. And people were willing to, uh, Adventists wound up getting a disproportionate share of scientists. The I devil think. is a scientist, quite a good one actually. And when he comes, he will satisfy all our needs temporarily except the need for truth. And you see, if you're a scientist, one of the things that's kind of drummed into you is that you're supposed to be searching for truth. Now, there's a lot of people who fail at that, but that's the ideal. It's very clearly put out. <coughs> and that's someplace that, if you're dealing with truth, you have an advantage. I think this whole issue is complicated by the fact that uh, once you say, well, there has to be God, that is not the same thing as saying God created in six days a few thousand years ago. Uh, so there can be a lot of compromised positions that mm -hmm. you take, and a lot of Christian churches take these compromised positions, uh, that the Bible is not correct. Uh, however, we need to take the Bible more seriously if we're going to believe in the kind of God that is... Uh, trying to do everything to save us. Well, you know, it's very interesting because um, I was uh, dealing with a, uh, a blog on the uh, Uncommon Descent website, uh, a, a post, and, they, and they, they came out with, uh, one of these guys came out with, well, you guys are, you know, your theology is all messed up because you know, why would God create over millions of years when he could have done it in six days and this kind of stuff, you know, you just, you're crazy. He's coming at it from an evolutionary point of view and he's basically, he's using that to hammer them over the head theologically, which is interesting and tells you that there's a whole lot more theology than what people let on is going on. Um, but what I found interesting was I responded saying, well, you know, that's one of the advantages of being young earth creationist or young life creationist at least, is that, you know, all of the evil that comes into the, into the world can be blamed on sin, on human sin, specifically. And it was interesting. He didn't touch it after that. And none of the theistic evolutionists touched it after that which I found even more interesting. I, our position is not that indefensible. We, we need to stop hanging our heads as if we're, uh, we're in trouble, because we're not. At least that's my opinion. I have one final thought, for me anyway. <laughs> well, we'll let, we'll let this be the final thought other than to say come back next week for Dr. Brand. I spent an afternoon with a Jewish physician talking theology and he said the definition of Messiah is he who brings peace on earth. And he said even Hitler, had he succeeded in corralling the whole world and brought peace, could have been the Messiah. So there is an overwhelming delusion that loose amongst mankind that will only grow in the end days. <laughs>